today is going to give you an introduction to the use of groundwater models for groundwater resource evaluation and then take you through sort of some more applied examples. The work that you do in the lecture session will then continue on into the workshop session this afternoon. So I guess without further ado, um, I'll pass you over to Chen Ming. Um, I hope you enjoy the, the session. I won't be available in the workshop session this afternoon, but if you do have any questions or queries, you can raise them with Chen Ming and the tutorial staff in the session. Otherwise, um, put a post on the discussion board for me. But if you can just join me in welcoming Chen Ming. Thanks, Peyton, um, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm not the first time coming over here. Yeah. Um, so today's topic is related to groundwater resource evaluation. So it's a very important aspect of uh, groundwater modeling. And um, it, it's very important in particular for this country. So I basically try to design everything within the context of this country and uh, trying to see how this is being adopted. So the, the overview is, um, first of all, I'll introduce uh, the importance of groundwater as a resource in Australia. I'll talk about Great Artesian Basin. And I'll also talk about the processes to evaluate groundwater resources. And then I'll bring two examples uh, during the workshop, but during the uh, lecture sessions, you will be fully aware of what is the processes involved and then what needs to be considered in those models. So in the practical session, so you try to play with the uh, script and do some sensitivity analysis. But in the meantime, you could work on the workshop as well, right? Now, groundwater resources in Australia. I'm basically bring quite a bit um, statistics here to show how important are they. So the first of all is that in Australia, groundwater makes up approximately 17% of accessible water resources and accounts for over 30% of total water consumption. Well, comparably, this is much larger as compared to many other countries. Why? The reason is just on the graph on the right-hand side. So you can see that this is basically the rainfall in Australia. So the highest rainfall is at the northern part in Weipa, in Darwin, about more than 200 millimeters. The western uh, Tasmania also received significant rainfall, 200 mils. So once you go there, it's generally say the number of rainy days you receive there is the same as the number of sunny days which you receive here. So it's just a just different climate. But these are not the majorities. The majority is actually right in the middle. So you see what is the rainfall rate? Around 100, 400. Brisbane is okay, one meter, one meter. But still, it's arid, it's semi-arid climate, right? So um, in that case, how about the water resources here? Nothing but groundwater, right? The second thing one is that um, Australia use of groundwater has increased significantly over recent decades. And the statistic here shows that from 83 to 96, increased by 90%. Okay, why? Well, obviously, population growth, right? The second is increased mining. So if you set up a mine somewhere in the middle, you don't have any portable water. You don't have, have much rainfall. So where's the water coming from? You look for the groundwater, you pump it down so that your peat is unsaturated, and then the water could be used for domestic or industry, but you produce waste, and then the waste comes with slurries, that's what we call tailings, and tailing needs to be dried, and none of the water must uh, shouldn't go down to the groundwater table because downstream there are people using groundwater as well. That's how the groundwater is being used in the central part of Australia. In Northern Territory, as you can see, over 90% of the water supply comes from groundwater and there are so many bores there. I'll discuss this uh, a bit further in detail, but these are the statistics. Um, water, groundwater resources in Australia, so Native um, vegetation and animals live solely on groundwater on their survival. So I put the red kangaroo. So these kangaroos are very smart to find out water holes. 
Those water holes are the window of groundwater, which are more or less permanently um, exist, even in the drought season, so that they can survive. The second one is the river red gum. Um, this is a very popular vegetation in River Murray, where we are discussing it um, at a later stage. So their roots are very smart. They are always trying to stretch their roots uh, very close to the water table. They are not diving into the water table, because that will get themselves being suffocated. So if you have used the evapotranspiration package within model flow, you know there's a kind of the extinction depth, which is the roots, average roots. What we find is that the um, identification of the river red gum root depth is actually an indicator of where the average water table is, because they always try to smartly locate their roots immediately above the water table. They don't get suffocated, but they have en enough water resources to be able to make them survive. So these are the evidences. In Arizona, groundwater sustains important natural and cultural values. Well, I w when I was preparing this, I was thinking about, I, I don't really want them to be just showing here. I was just trying to think, what does this implicate? Well, um, I originally come from China. I grew up there. I would say most of the folklores are related to floods, not much to the, um, the drying. And then I was thinking about what is the indigenous folklores, and I find one. Maybe, maybe you guys know that. So it was said that there is a uh, frog. <laughs> okay, so you know that, which basically engulfed all the uh, river water, lake water, and pond water. And then there's no water around, and all the other, other animals is trying to, um, to make him laugh so that they can spill out all the water. And some um, snake wiggled, and the kangaroo hopped, but they don't laugh. And the eel basically twists themselves in the situation so bad that the um, frog laugh out, and then water comes out, and eventually they have water. Well, this is the first time. When I write down this sentence, I was thinking to add a bit component in it, and then I find this story, and I, I quite appreciate you know, the scarcity of the water. So the next part is um, the groundwater resources um, uh, in Australia. So these are the very important groundwater resources. Uh, the first one, Great Artesian Basin. Have you ever heard of this Great Artesian Basin? Everybody? Oh, that's great. Um, this basin is very important resources, and how does it work? Well, the first time when it was introduced to me, it was said that rainfall from Cairns goes all the way to Adelaide. And I was completely out of mind and see, wow, this basin is quite significant. I'll show some statistics later on, so we don't unwrap here at the moment. The second one we will also unwrap later on is Murray Darling Basin, which is the main southeast part of Australia. So you can see it. It starts from the northeast and then goes to the Adelaide as the uh, river mouth. And it's slightly different from Great Artesian Basin. The water resource is not groundwater itself because it's sea line, but the river is fresh. And that's the only water resources within this basin. Right? But to be able to manage that basin, you need to understand well the groundwater system so that the less salt is able to come to these valuable freshwater resources. The third one is um, Gagana Gara region in northern Perth. So here is the um, Swan River. So the river mouth is here at the city. So you can see a lot of ala branches is stretched into um, this uh, region. And that's basically the water source of um, the Swan River. And as a result of this, uh, the, the the uh, Perth water resources is mostly rely on groundwater, even though it's decreasing due to the rise of the um, seawater uh, freshening uh, desalinization uh, methods. But still, you can see um, this brings significant resources to um, Perth. The next one is uh, water resources in Perth. So we look at the histories. So back in 1960s, um, the population is half a million, and the water supply is 100 gigaliters. Stream flow is quite significant, 420 gigaliters. And the water usage, 88% comes out from dams. 
and groundwater is 12. The salinization is zero. We don't have that technology back then. Groundwater replenishment is zero as well. What does it mean, groundwater replenishment? Anyone have an idea? Recharge. Why do we need to recharge back to the aquifer? Yeah. Okay, and then. If we didn't recharge, You mean water level going down? The aquifer itself is going down. If we don't recharge. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, you know, my simplest way of understanding aquifer is a water saturated sponge with a load on top. So, the load is counterbalanced by the skeleton of the sponge plus the water. Now, you find fresh water resources, you pump it out, and what will happen? Most of the load will be taken by the skeleton and that will sink. This is a big problem for big cities, big problem. It's, not, it's also another problem as well, geochemical problems, but let's don't touch on that for now. In most of the cities, you always need to pump water back before you use it. So once the population grows, probably using groundwater is not a smart way. Now look at the, the situation right now. Sorry, just unwrapped a bit too much. Um, Population 2 million, water supply tripled, dam production reduced significantly. Why? Stream flow reduces. Right? You don't have much stream flow, you wouldn't have much water in the dam. Now, desalinization increased significantly, and groundwater component is increasing, but their fraction is decreasing. Right? The projection says that groundwater will still be a major component in 2035 but desalination will shoot out. But if you look at the dams, it's becoming very, very small. So that's basically what happens in Perth. What happens in Brisbane? Where's the water supply? Wyvenhoe. Say it again? Wyvenhoe. Wyvenhoe, that's right, yes. Do we use groundwater much? Not really, but it was proposed. You know when? Back in 2007. 2007. During that drought, there was a proposal that you need to finish shower back in five minutes. And um, you know where is the groundwater resources potentially used in Brisbane? Anyone give an idea? Think about the big lands. Farming? Say it again. Farming? Farming? Mm, not really. They need to farm. <laughs> they need water. <laughs> Any other places? Groundwater. We green areas. Green areas. Where are the green areas? Parks. Parks and golf courses. Okay. It's not in the middle of the city, no. Where are the possibility? Somewhere in the north, in the east, in the south? Industry. Industry? From industry lands. No, using industry uses groundwater. Yes. Yeah. But where does the groundwater coming from? Oh, yeah. yeah. Where does the groundwater coming from if Brisbane is under water crisis? Speak it out. West, under the, because the Great Artesian Basin is in Queensland. Oh, so you basically extract water from the Great Artesian Basin to Brisbane. It's a bit too far. Too far. Yeah, too far. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, North Struck Brook Island. Yeah. It's a fresh, fresh water length, completely sandy. So rainfall, the amount of rainfall is equal to the amount of water mixed to the ocean. So if you smartly extract it, you probably reduce the evaporation, but still you have water to be able to uh, use. It hasn't happened, which is great, but this is a possibility. I'm just saying those things was planned back then. Now, water resource, aquifer resources in Australia. So obviously, the blue one means it's, it's rich, whereas the yellow ones are relatively poor. So you can see the way how it's being defined the ones that are rich in aquifer is called porous because the porosity is high, so that the, uh, and also the region is large. If you still consider it as a sponge, it's a big sponge. Whereas if it's a fractured or fissured rock, it usually have a very small porosity, and as a result, the aquifer resources are very, very small. So if you pump it, you could imagine, you drill all the way, say, 100 meters, and you pump, 
the pool productivity one will get emptied very quickly, and you will have to wait for the next day until it comes back, and then you pump it. Whereas the bigger ones, they probably water level doesn't drop down, and you have continuous water usage there. Now, let's dive a little bit into a statistic of um, Great Attrition Basin. So this is just to show how important are they. So 3,000 meters deep, well, that really means you have to drill a big borehole. Usually those boreholes are completely sealed, so you can't see through, and it's permanent, and the water has got the water meter, how much you consume, and it's a big cubic meter of groundwater. The average temperature is 30 to 100 degrees Celsius. So the usually groundwater temperature is relatively stable. So if you've got some recharge, you actually see the perturbation of the temperature. So temperature is actually a signature of any recharge processes. The maximum temperature for water is 100 until you get a kind of superheated water, but that's usually not the case. That will produce steam, so 100 is maximum. And the age is between uh, 100,000 to over a million of years. How this is being identified? Can you roughly guess how those ages have been identified? Carbon, Carbon yeah, that's right. Um, so basically isotopes. So by tracing different types of isotope, which they have different um, um, aging cycle, they can identify that. The other way is basically mass balance. So if you consider this, Attrition basin as a swimming pool. You got an inflow, you got an outflow. You can calculate the inflow by rainfall or a discount due to recharge, some of them in the uns unsaturated zone. You can tell how much water, um, by how many years the rainfall is able to recharge back to the aquifer. So that's another indirect way of calculating usually how, the, how long is the age. So the inflow is coming from the Great Divide, Mountain Divide. And then recharge there, goes all the way through um, four states and coming out from the, the eastern, eastern uh, part of the Northern Territory and in uh, South Australia. So that's where the water comes out. And there are a few locations where the outflow are quite dominant, Dalhousie uh, Springs and Elizabeth Springs in these locations. So this one is uh, 200, 50 kilometers um, southeast to Alice Springs. Now, aquifer evaluation processes. I'm trying to cover those basic principles um, quite quickly, and then let's move to a case study, because case study, we provide evidence, and then you make a decision. It's, it's a basically a practice of these methods, right? So in terms of evaluation process, the first is exploration. So what do you look at? Desktop. Look at the geology and then look at the stratigraphy and where the sandy layers are, local climate, and that is able to identify a likelihood of having groundwater. The second is evaluation stage. So now you need to bring gears. You bring the, um, the driller, the pumpings. You probably can have multiple, one for production, the other one is for um, observation. So how you do is, um, you pump at a constant rate to see when the borehole can reach a steady state. So that's basically the production rate. The second way is that you try to install another borehole somewhere away from this production bore. So you see how much water is drawing down as a result of pumping event. That is able to tell you um, how the overall aquifer is respond to this pumping activity. Again, this event takes a few days at max maximum. The final way you need to identify is basically to look at the interaction between groundwater and the regional hydrology system. So imagine the process is to look for the sponge. You need to look at how big the sponges are and how much water is received, the sponge is receiving. So this will require a few years of the use of the pump and then see the groundwater responses so then you can identify a sort of um, sweet spot where pumping is always taking place, but the vegetation or water table is not being changed significantly. So you basically make use of the evaporated water rather than explore the aquifer to the stage where it cannot be replenished again. So that's, in general, the ideas. 
The um, exploration of aquifers, so we've got quite a few ways. Um, desktop search, as we discussed, we have um, different uh, state has different um, uh, web page. So you go to it and find a place that you're interested in, and then you can have the aquifer logs. So I think I'm sure that you have already read a few logs. It tells you uh, a few things. So one is formation. So that's more related to geology. When we call hydrogeology, the geology is actually important so that um, when you look at the name, you can more or less identify the hydrological parameters of the soil. Uh, the other part is the, what's the feeling of it? So usually when the spoils, the sample comes out, we basically look at the moisture content, whether it's greater than liquid limit or it's fully water saturated. Um, what's the color? What's the smell? So that can also be written in the block. And finally is the EC, electrical conductivity. So this is associated with three things. One is mineralogy. So if your soil has got a lot of irons, it's conductive without water, even without water. The second is moisture content, because water conducts uh, current as well. The third is salinity. So it's a bulk of these three things all together. But it gives you an indicative uh, information about what that layer is, right? Then we basically do the drilling as we discussed. Um, then uh, the, the, the another one is the seismic refraction and um, electrical resistivity methods. So those are the non-invasive way. We basically introduce a wave. It could even be a sound wave or a resistivity wave to see how it's being responded. So in that case, we don't need to drill. We basically just put a few detectors on the top and then map the moisture profile or aquifer uh, resistivity, and that is able to tell us what is the aquifer condition. And the finally is the pumping test that is t telling you the actual parameters of um, the aquifer. I'm just showing you quickly the borehole database. So this is a image of the water connect. I use it um, just um, for interest about um, what is the water conditions in uh, uh, the, the aquifer conditions around um, the uh, potential Olympic site. And you can see that all the borehole were designed for CLAMP 7 back in that time, right? But in general, down in, our, um, down in uh, Brisbane, there is a quite thick layer of sandy layer. Um, so it's first the alluvial clay, and then it's the sandy layer. And the sandy layer was found to be quite responsive to a uh, tide. So there was one case we were pumping about three kilometers away from the river. We hope that we can produce a cone of depression. But we pumped for seven days, and the water table never drew down. And then at the end of the day, we realized that we are basically trying to fight against the tidal force, because whatever we've been pumped in, is immediately replenished by river water. And then, obviously, you wouldn't be able to form any sorts of cone of depressions there. That's general, the um, stratigraphy is down in Brisbane. Right? So that's a list of the quick questions when you do the evaluations. Um, where should the well be located? How many need it? Pump test rates sustained? The pumping scheme yield? or um, influences, so it's also economical and, um, uh, and environmental. And what are the side effects? So that's the important ways to evaluate if we want to pump, if we, if we want to exploit um, the groundwater, what would be the side effects? Right, so that's basically a background of the evaluations. And I happen to, um, well, these, these three is the different yields we also discussed. It's the well yield, aquifer yield, and the basin yield. So the scale increases from a well scale to a sponge scale, and finally go to the hydrological processes. So I wouldn't go that into detail. It's, it's just the different scales. We would like, I happen to have an opportunity to um, work on um, a, a important um, Water, system, uh, water resources system down in River Murray. Um, Thomas happened to be uh, the research thesis on this project, and Yuan Qi is also working on this as a PhD. 
So uh, this is a very interesting project that gives a peek on how the water resources is being protected by human activities. Um, and also, you know, given it's a relatively long-lasting project, it gives you a feeling of how research is going on, how, how to basically evaluate the processes. And I try to wrap it in a way that how I understand this system. Because in, in the past, this was a name for me. And now I just feel that I'm so much into it. And I try to help or try to put my effort to, to make this one more sustainable. So that's the feeling. Now, when you look at this picture, it has quite a few very uh, interesting features. Well, river is quite clear. So it meanders through this um, land. And um, around the river, you can see um, this dark, um, uh, dark color. And this is where the trees are. So trees tended to stay next to the river. Uh, but outside of this area, you see still there are trees. Um, but it's much more sparse as compared to here. And then the surface is more or less like a kind of searish. So why that happens? This is where we call flood plain. Flood plain is the location where if there is a flood, it's going to be inundated. But if it's in the dry season, the river just stay within the channel, right? We usually don't stay there. We, don't, we, we, we usually don't um, construct buildings there, given if you do so, it's going to be flooded. And, um, and, and I happen to meet a few um, um, residents there. Their lands are massive, like 100 acres, and they usually don't go there on a the year, on the the yearly basis. So maybe they go there once per year, but it's part of their um, land. They need to ensure everything's fine. Um, yeah, so the red part is the highlands. The highlands is usually around 30 to 50 meters higher than the flood plain. And so if you could imagine that um, in the past, the river, the whole land was covered by the red, which we call rocks and sand. But over time, during the flooding, it just erodes the surface and eventually allow the flood plain to form. So there were locks and sand next to the river, but because of the erosion, it becomes bigger and bigger. That's what it happened. Um, so what happens on those highlands, farming, residential area, or even rural areas? So that's where human activities is taking place. Right? That's just the landscape of what River Murray looks like. In terms of water resources, as we just mentioned, the groundwater there is saline. Why? Because many years ago, Australia used to be our ocean. And because of the shale activity, the elevation started coming up and then becomes a mainland. But underneath, it was still saline water, given it was the ocean. And the groundwater was very, very old. The salinity is exactly the same as seawater, 35 ppt. And if you use the EC, it's 50,000 micro siemens per centimeter. So that was a, another indication was that it was a, um, it was a, a ocean back then. The river is the only water resources there. The rainfall is 200 millimeters, nothing, nothing. Yeah. And also, the, um, I think it's also part of the climate change the rainfall tends to be intensified in a few events, where it was a significant downpour, and that's it. And in that case, people tend to, um, you know, um, to, to manage the, the, uh, the significant amount of rainfall rather than store it somewhere. It's not a continuous rainfall. Um, so fresh water is the only resource. So what would be the impact? The impact would be groundwater is slowly discharging to the river. And if you go further downstream, what will happen? The salinity increases to a level that it cannot be used again. So it's actually our responsibility to maintain the, the quantity of the river so that it can be used to. So that's the general background. Again, some statistics. 
So covering an area of that billion kilometers, well, you could imagine the map I just showed before. It's the majority of the uh, southeast part of Australia, one of the largest river systems. And it produces around 40% of the nation's food and agricultural export. So it's grain, wool, beef, and dairy. So those are mostly related to uh, animals, but it also have uh, citrus, almond, and um, oranges, uh, uh, the um, tomatoes as well. And it has an average ring, uh, annual um, flow of um, 11,000 gigaliters. Well, I tried to find out a way to understand what does that mean. What does it mean, gigaliters? Well, one megaliter, 1.5 megaliter, is the amount of water in the UQ Aquatic Center. Okay. So this is 11, well, this is actually 11 million of the UQ swimming pool size. Let's give you a rough idea of how big it is. And it contains over 30,000 wetlands, and some of them are in the Rasma Convention, which is a convention to preserve the wetlands. And it has many native fish species, and some of them are migratory. And as we just discussed, this is the only reliable freshwater resources. Rainfall is too small. Groundwater sea line, what else can you rely on? Only that river. We need to protect it, right? right. No. OK, so this chart shows what is the salinity change over time within the river. So you can see that over the so many years, so the x-axis is year, and then the y-axis is the EC with a unit of micro siemens per centimeter. So it's 800 by average. OK, as an indicator, tap water is 400 micro siemens per centimeter, right? Uh, sea water is 50,000 micro siemens per centimeter. So it's quite fresh, isn't it? It's quite fresh. The solubility limits, solubility limits of sodium chloride is 200,000 micro siemens per centimeter. So it's roughly eight times of sea water. So in that case, seawater still have a lot of space to add salt, right? Yeah, but that's just an indicator. Right, so if you look at the fluctuations, um, one of the key points here is, again, 2007. What happens? Droughts, right? OK, if a drought happens, what, ha what, what, will, what will happen to the river is that water level goes down, groundwater remains as it is, and there is a huge head, head, head difference between groundwater and salt water. And this fresh, sorry, this is river water and groundwater, and that enhances the saline groundwater discharge to the river and eventually cause the river to be more saline. Right? So because of the drought, which is a big warning for us, it started to have a basin plan. What does it mean basin plan? That's actually the official time we have what we call Murray Darling Basin Authority. So it has a range of intervenes to ensure um, the Murray River is um, flowing, the river is healthy over time, given we are using the water resources uh, heavily in that region. Now, this is a map of what happens um, it's, it's a kind of landscape of um, how the aquaculture is being distributed around the river. So the, the uh, human settlements uh, were predominantly after the First World War II. So the soldiers were sent to along the river. So they started with established farms. And the farm needed water, and they pump water from the river. Right? And then over time, the farm increases and expands so this is where Renmark is. Well, I, I didn't know Renmark, but I knew, once I went there, I realized this is one of the most tourist spots in South Australia, after Barossa. Barossa is where the vine yards are. This is three hours drive from Adelaide. So you can see quite a, few, quite a lot of um, um, farms is already taking place. They've already improved their irrigations. They used to watering it. Now it's dripping, so it's more efficient. But what is the problem? What is the problem induced by um, irrigation? There are two. And one of the obvious, obvious ones is that they use uh, river water, isn't it? 
What is the other one? Why soil becomes more saline? Because of the quality of water we're using. So if we reduce the, OK, yes. So you say that if we pump water to irrigation, the water level reduces, and the water that grows, the, the fresh water reduces, and then the head difference becomes. Yes, that's another point. Any others? Have a think about it. Use fertilizer. So that is another indicator, yes. Any others? There's something regarding our head, groundwater head. Anyone pop up? You want to say something? No? Very important. Try, I, I hope that pops out from your mind. Nothing? All good? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. No worries. Yeah. Recharge, yes. Well, even though they are using drip, you can't always assure that all of the water is being taken by the vegetation. You always have a bit of drip that eventually goes down to water table. Now, the water table is saline, and you bring fresh water and the saline water, and I'll allow the, the saline water to further increase and that again increased the head difference between saline water and fresh water, and again increased the salt loads, right? But then if enough fresh water is going down into the water table, does it dilute the salt water? It's very small as compared to the big land, yeah. And there are some studies believe that there are fresh water length mm. seats on top of the saline water, and they never mix, they never mix, given that the water flow is relatively slow. But again, these tiny little standalone water bubbles, as compared to the ocean, is far too small to make a difference. Right? So there are quite a heavy studies on that. The other interesting study, which already been established, was that um, the time between the establishment of the farm to the time when actual recharge is taking place is usually five to 10 years. That is because the recharge can only be taking place by infiltration from the top of the mountain all the way down to the water table, which is usually a distance of 50 meters. Right? So those are the other indicator to say, if you apply a recharge to your model, it's usually taking place a few years after the establishment of the farm. So you don't do it straight away. Right? So, so those are the issues if we do farming, and, and that, that is not only using the water from the freshwater resources, but also allow groundwater to rise, and that also creates a huge head difference between the two, and they increase the salt load back to the river. And then this comes to money. So what is the pricing? Again, megaliters, remember 1.5 meters is the UQ swimming pool volume. And each swimming pool used to be cost about 200 bucks back in 2005. Again, <laughs> increased in 2007. So it's one, uh, 1,500. And it goes all the way down. And back, remember, we, back in 2019, that was the time we have a lot of fires around. And it was significant drought. And then later on, it goes to Nanina. So this is what well, we, we assume this is currently towards the end of the Nanina, and then Ernino will come up. But still, the price is pretty good. Now, it comes into the usage. Almond trees are always the ones who use most of the water. So 9 to 12 megaliters per year, per hectare. Citrus is 8 to 10 megaliters per hectare per year. Vine yards are 4 to 6 megaliters per year. And well, this is basically the overall consumption per year. But in terms of the urgency, it's the other way around. Because usually shrubs needs to be watered more often as compared to trees. You know, I happened to went to a farm where there was a drought. And the first thing they tried to water by carrying the IBC tanks. 
is uh, lettuce. So the lettuce has got very fresh. If they not watered regularly, they just wilted very quickly. So the smaller ones, they need to regularly water. So it's the other way around. But nevertheless, the almond is the one that uses most of the water. And then now it becomes an open discussion here. So the issue be brought in by climate change um, is that water level, water is going down. And then we also have farming that reduce or cease the river water flow. So even at some stage, the river were not there anymore, right? And then it brought in high salinity. And it also have flooding events if you don't control it. Do you think there is any sorts of artificial methods could be implemented to control river salinity and regulate the flow? So this is what exactly Murray Darling Basin Authority does. What are the options they can? Can you have any ideas? You have pump tops of the river by weirs. Pump? Weirs. 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 OK, so water locks, right? OK. Any others? Have you heard? I think it's been quite popular on the media. No ideas? I think weir is a good idea. I'll introduce that later on. OK. What are others? No? Any ways to control salt? Or any way to reduce the head difference between groundwater and freshwater? Now you end up with this. Saline groundwater, fresh river water. Is there any way to reduce this? No, really? No way. There are. Go ahead. Exactly. Out of what? Out of river? Out of groundwater. This is something called salt interception scheme. Yeah. So what they does is that it constructs a few balls along the river and pump them out so that the water level reduces, that the groundwater level reduces to a level that reduces the salt loads. Right? That's exactly the authority is doing. What impacts for flooding? This is also something I, when I was right then. So flooding obviously needs to be, um, uh, you know, you, you, you need to save the area that is potentially floods. So after flood, what could be the issue? Is flood always the good thing? Well, this has been a long time. Everyone believed that floods is the way to replenish fresh water to the groundwater system. What are the other issues by floods? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes, actually, usually, usually the area that are not regularly flooded has got rich nutrients, and if the floods come in they will brought those things back into the river. And at the river receipt, you will see that the nutrient concentration is much higher than the regular level. And that's the moment when the, 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 the fish could die out as a result of reaching nutrient. Yeah. So flood is not really a, um, always a safe, even if somehow relief the, um, the, the saline conditions. Right, OK, so now we discussed that there are two ways. So by setting up locks, the other one is salt interceptions. So let's have a look at that. So first is the River Marie locks. So it starts from lock one near the coast to lock 10 all the way up. So that basically makes the river as individual compartments. But they are not completely sealed. You always allow a bit of water to move down to maintain the flow. But in the very worst case scenario, imagine if we don't have much water from upstream, what you can do is that you basically contain them as a compartments. So you still have a river that has never been dried out. In that case, we can avoid any nutrient coming out as we just discussed about the impact of flooding. Right? So this is one of the views of the lock. Um, upstream water level is higher than the lower, but still it allows water to move to the downstream. 
and then water is the river is always there. Now, you pump significant amount of salt in the aquifer. You need to bring them to somewhere, right? So what it does is that this water is being conveyed all the way to a catchment that is completely outside of the aquifer in the river and dispose them off. So this disposal area, it looks like tailing storage facility, you know, it, but in a different aspect, could either be live as it is or harvest as a salt. So that's how the Murray River salt comes out. So you can buy them from um, any uh, supermarket. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically made in Australia. And you can see um, this is this legend, 32 kilometers. It travels almost 100 kilometers all the way from the pumping area to the disposal basin. And um, the location is not all the way around the river because it's otherwise too expensive. What it happens is that they try to assess where is the majority salt load to the river and trying to reduce the saline water table in that particular location. So, and a few locations has already been identified. Right? Now, salt interception scheme comes out and then um, river is being cut into sections. Is there any side effects? It's something related to the floodplain. What will happen to the floodplain? No idea. Vegetation will try because this water table That's one of the points. Yes. Water table gets lower down, so vegetation becomes less. Land subsidence, it's part of it, but there's no, yes, it happens, um, but at least there's no constructions on top, so that's not too bad. Increase the salinity of the water. You do have, um, if the water level, if the groundwater level, saline groundwater reduces, the evaporation near the surface could be reduced as well. So it's not a direct impact. Instead, if the saline water table is close to the surface, then the floodplain salinity would be very, very high because evaporation is constantly taking up. Yeah, not particularly on this. Any other things? This is something related to flooding. Because of the river um, is carted by the compartments, the flooding, the natural flooding frequency is significantly reduced. And in a natural condition, this ecosystem has managed to, uh, to wait the flooding, the next flooding, in a regular period, which used to be every four years. And now, because of the compartments, which means more water could be used rather than allow natural flooding, the flooding frequency becomes reduced. Back in some time, uh, the River Marie alluvial soil, you can find mussels inside. Those mussels are basically waiting for the water to come back. But if they don't, if they go through the kind of wilting point or a dying point, they will not come back again. So that was the issue. Well, this is a video that shows when we went there, um, a kind of landscape of the, the, um, the floodplain. So you can see some of the trees are still surviving. Some of them is start to die. Um, but it's not just because of these two management. It's also um, all the other processes as well, so climate change and everything. So, you know, we can do something. It's just give it the feeling that we, we can do something, right? Yeah. So the big ones is the river red gum, the one that I mentioned, they have very smart roots. They always put their roots immediately above water table and, yeah, not going further down, yeah. And then the little ones, are shops are nigonum. They have a very sophisticated roots underneath as well. Yeah, so that was um, what it does it look like. So this is the highland. So you can see it's very high as compared to the floodplain. 
And those places were uh, flooded uh, during the flooding seasons. Now, we need to save the floodplain. Otherwise, they are dying. So this is what we call environmental watering. So given the river water level is being controlled by the logs, natural flooding is not able to flood them. So the only way is to introduce water into these areas. Right? Environmental watering is one of the processes. So this is an example of environmental watering. So they have a regulator. They can open the pump, the, the gate, to allow significant amount of fresh water to cover the whole floodplain so it gets watered. And because of this watering, the vegetation will grow. Right? The other scenario is that you identify some of the low-lying area, which more or less look like a basin, and you pump water in. So the pump is done by diesel pump with, say, one megaliter per day. And then the, mel the, um, the hose is about um, 200 mil, but four, four, 200 millimeters in diameter, 400 meters long, to go from the uh, river to the location where you need to pump water to. That's the exercise right now. And it was established back in 2012. So that was immediately after the authority was established. So you, you control the water, but in the meantime, you need to return water to the system. And then return about um, 2,075 gigaliters of water to the environment. And in that case, fresh water is introduced to the floodplain by engineering methods pumps, gates, outlets, and channels, right? The recovered floodplain system, they do have recovered floodplain system, but also brought issues. What are the potential issues here? Well, I'll just stay here for half a minute, so if any of your groups sitting on the desk is able to, first of all, identify the issues, or second, any sorts of field investigation that you can do to quantify those processes. Is the question clear? Is the question clear? So number one is, what are the problems introduced by environmental worry? The second is, to be able to monitor this process, what field work you like to do to be able to um, quantify those processes. Can any group have an answer and then let's just write down on the whiteboard. All right, yeah? Have a discussion, say one to two minutes. I think you can even draw a sketch, say, you know, if you want to do something here to be able to monitor the process. And at least for me, we basically have a discussion with them and then end up with a plan eventually. So I, 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 I kind of enjoyed it. So I hope that now you are in the same page and what plan you would like to introduce. Yeah.
You ready? Yeah, sure. It really depends. So uh, for this type of exercise, if, the, if you basically pump to the level where it starts off spilling, that's the moment you stop. Otherwise, it's just a kind of waste the energy for pumping, isn't it? But if it's um, slow is the gate, it basically, again, introduces the water and allows slightly outlet as well. So you, you have a kind of continuous water movement within the flat plane and going out of the flat plane as well. So it all depends. Um, I think this one is depending on how much water they've been given. So um, they first identify the specific amount of water they are allowed to pump, and then identify the key locations where um, uh, they can be revived. It's most valuable to revive. Yeah. So. Right, okay. Um, from my experience, the rainfall there is not help anything for recharge. It's only 200 mil. Yeah. So basically, the flooding is because it's coming from all the way upstream where the rainfall is significant. So it's the water from there. And nothing contributes when the river is in the dry zone. That's the only water resources. Yeah. 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 Upwards, you then the head difference is if if that's the case then it's going to go it's supposed to go down because the groundwater level is lower than that. Yeah. It is, yeah, 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 yeah. But the groundwater level will be not higher than the surface water level. That wouldn't happen. Yeah. Mm, we'll discuss that. Yeah, we'll discuss that. It could be part of the problem there. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. If they well, if it's just a flooding, they are fine. Yeah. But if you if you flooded them for a year, then it's a problem. Yeah. Shall we start? So, any team would like to start with their drawing? What type of instrument you like to put in? Uh, what investigation you would like to figure out the water balance or even salt balances there? You would like to start with? Just do some, nothing is wrong. Yeah, give it a go. Give it a go. Yeah. yeah. Not a problem. This was exactly how I was encountered and say, look, this is the situation. Can you end up with a plan? And I draw something and they are quite happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, four holes. Yeah. 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 Okay, okay. Yeah, that's the plan. Yeah, so in that case, would you think that uh, where is the location of these three balls? So this is groundwater level or? Uh... Oh, sorry, that was just the bottom of the basin. Okay, so the bottom of the basin, say, like this, yeah? So this is the surface? Yeah. Is that the case? Yeah. Where are the location of the three balls? Oh, wait, I was going to use the three. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, what do you guys mm. reckon? Location. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even. even, okay, yeah, even, right. So, are they all inside the pond or outside? Inside. Inside, right. So the pond is like this, yeah. 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 This is what you want to see. Maybe we should outside there. Uh, outside, yeah. putting one. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's stretch like that. Okay. Okay. Does that like the plan? You happy with it? Okay. Sure. Okay. All good. Give it a go. 
You want to give it a try? Well, it's a little bit unfair to the first trial because they can always add on top of it. Yeah, but you know, there's nothing right or wrong. It's just to create a plan. You want to give it a go? Any one of you? No? No plan? Well, this is a way to, you know, at least you have an interesting project to work with. You know, what, otherwise you will, you know, produce on top of this. Any idea? Thomas? Yeah. You can start from scratch if you want to. Yes, yes. So what processes you would like to monitor? Okay, so you can draw another one on top. So this would be... Yeah, okay. Okay. What does, what does it measure? Say so you can put ET here, so, so that we know ET is part of it. Okay. Temperature, yeah. Rainfall, yeah. 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 So that's part of weather station. Yeah. Yeah. So these are supposed to be boreholes. Yeah. So these are the one three inside. There's one outside. I mean, at least we thought about this, right? Yeah. Okay. Any others? Or that's fine. Stay with that. Okay. Borehole next to the weather station. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It is the same basin. Say it again. Piezometer, of course, yeah. You draw your borehole, you need to put up piezometers, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, any others? Well, I'll tell you what happens later on, you know, and then I actually learn on top of what I haven't done. So, <laughs> you, you, you want to draw something on top, or are you happy with that? Uh, maybe just like how we can measure soil at different boreholes as well, so we know how much is the salinity. You say soil EC. Uh, soil, like salinity. Salt, salt, okay. So EC measurement, let's put yeah. in an EC. So let's say groundwater and EC, yeah? And even on the, uh, in the river as well. So in the river as well. So let's put in river in here, right? Yeah. Okay, so EC and groundwater, yeah? Okay. Any others? We're all happy. That really means, if it's quiet, then means this is the plan that you all are happy with it. I just need a confirmation. You're happy with it? Yes, yes, okay. You happy with it? Yeah. How does the well the rain? Oh, it's um, E weather station. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> Groundwater EC, EC temperature. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh. and rainfall. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Ecosystem monitoring. Ecosystem monitoring. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how about the other team? What do you guys think? Or I need a confirmation. So you, you want to introduce any more things right here, or you're happy with it? You're happy with it? No more. So this is the final plan from all the brains in this room, OK? Yeah? OK? There's no way to regret, OK? So now we bring gears down and then do these things. And there is a chance you miss something. Don't worry, I missed a lot. <laughs> yeah. OK, we're happy with it. OK, so now I'll show you my plan. Next slide. Well, it's not only my brain. It's also a brainstorm. And I really appreciate that. And I learned a lot from it as well. So pump. When you pump the amount of water, you need to read the meters, how much is being pumped in. That is recorded. Yeah. Now, before we move to that, let's just have an overall review of what's happening within the flood plain. Right. So we know that this is the highland, this is the flat plain, this is the river, and we've got something called freshwater length. What is freshwater length? It's the interface between freshwater and sea lion water. Why the length um, is, uh, why the salt water is somehow wedged into the fresh water is because salt water is saline than the fresh water. So the length is always allow the salt water to uh, wedge into the fresh water. So now in terms of processes, uh, we talked about there are Finchtown clay, locks and sand, 
within the highland. These are the formation name. You know, it's just the overall processes. Coolant Bijou, Monument Sands. Water table here is slightly higher than the river. Right? That allows to introduce. And then saline groundwater slowly moved there, mixed it. Evapotranspiration. So this is being monitored. Now we capture that. Great. Um, it's actually account for over 50%. We pump water. That needs to be monitored. And then we produce an environmental basin as a result of that. And this will cause recharge. Right? And the recharge would be able to be captured by those boreholes. This is the plan. Great. And then we've also got irrigation recharge, which lifted the water table. Well, but at least for now, this is not part of it. So um, it's far away from where the recharges are, given it's at the middle of the floodplain. But at least you see irrigation allows water level to rise. Now, what is this for? Soil interceptions. Now, basically, reduce the water level, the groundwater level. right? This gives a overall procedures, processes within that floor plan, which will be contributed to later on our original model. Right? Now, this is the inspections of the site before the watering. Well, why don't I just, OK, look at what we did. Yeah, so that's where the site is. We've got the river. We've got the, um, the orchards, the farms. This elevation is slightly high, so, but from the aerial image, it looks quite um, flat, but it's actually quite high. So that's where the pond is formed after the pumping. So this is the size of a vehicle. Right? So it's just to give indications. Um, so, so that's the creek and orchards, the size of a vehicle, and then this is 240 meters. Walking around takes roughly 40 minutes. Um, yeah. We actually encountered a snake at the time. Yeah. And then everyone was buying snake gators and these things. And I was the first person to spot the snake, which was about to attack. And a girl was um, next to the snake. And I was shouted out snake by natural. But I find there was a problem. I didn't tell her where is the snake. So she was pondering at that few seconds. I know that if the snake attacked, there will be a different story. But she smartly identifies in front of her and then start off going back. Because when she, when she was hearing there was a snake, it could be behind her. And if she does that, it's a different story. So what I learned from this is that when you identify, snake on your left. Okay? But at least that didn't happen. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's somewhere in this region as well. Yeah. Um, so pump inflow metered, we know how much water pumping. Rainfall monitored by what weather station? Evapotranspiration that also can be monitored by a weather station. So the weather station tells you the atmospheric capacity to evaporating water. So this is what we call pan evapotranspiration. So it's how strong the atmospheric force is able to take the water out. And then you've got the infiltration, right? Infiltration and recharge are different processes, OK? Infiltration is the moment where fresh water moves into the groundwater. Oh, sorry, ground, the, the soil. But the soil could be unsaturated. It hasn't hit the water table. The moment when you hit the water table is what we call recharge, right? So in that case, if you've got a rainfall, if the water is not enough, you only end up with infiltration. And the infiltration could be taken out by evapotranspirations, not by recharge. Right? And then what we did is exactly like this. So piezometer in the borehole, moisture sensors. We basically deployed quite a few moisture sensors here to see how the wet in front is moving down as well. So this is an additional thing we did. Um, we also monitored the surface water depth. So this is to put in a pressure transducer at the bottom, the, the deepest bottom of the tank, of the, the basin. And we also find the, the digital elevation model I think you guys have been working with. So in that case, if you know the depth of the water and the basin, you work out the volume of water inside. Yeah? 
and then weather station deployed here. So we also did one at outside of the pond. Oh, sorry, two monitoring boreholes outside the pond, and SA3. Um, this is another one at the perimeter. So this one was to um, monitor the differences between here and here. And then the, store, the mass balance is pond storage by the pressure transducer plus unsaturated zone storage in the moisture sensor is equal to inflow, pump, rainfall, minus ET, minus infiltration. It doesn't tell you recharge. It tells you infiltration, right? Recharge could be back calculated by the amount of water level rises, right? So that was the plan. I think we basically ticked the most of them. We ticked the most of them. That's great. So you see, always work together, brainstorm. That really helps. Um, now, I'll give you some of the evidence before we do that. So this was the site looks like before you do any events. So it's covered by shrubs, small shrubs. And then at the perimeter, it's covered by trees, by trees, yeah? Now, if you look at those shrubs, you actually see many holes here, many holes here. But if you shovel these holes, because I was thinking these are rabbit holes. That's my initial thoughts. So I opened it. It ends up with a pit. And then there are still interconnected channels. What does that form? How this is being formed? It's everywhere. It's not one spot, two spot. It's everywhere. Say it again. Groundwater? Groundwater? No, groundwater is quite deep. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Like the erodible spots inside. Erodible spots, okay. Yeah, that's very close now. Yeah, it's related to erosion. But there is another process, very important. It's something related to drying. Yeah. Cracking, yes, cracking, yeah. Remember, this is alluvial clay. Alluvial clay, once we go there, that was a dry moment. But there are times when they are flooded. The clay floods, what happens? Cracks. And why they have holes? Because they are rolling the winds, is covering those things. And, but they can't cover it 100%. They have some holes. And you open it, it's interconnected. So we believe that's the case. So we basically bring the clay and then just allow it to dry. So that's what happens. And imagine you have later on winds come in, and then that just cover the majority of the area. But still, you have interconnected channels. One of the information is that at least when we shovel, the depths of the cracks would be no longer than one meter. So Underneath, it becomes more or less like cemented. We wouldn't be able to shovel. We even bring crowbars, you know, the, the heavy ones, like, you know, you do that. No, no way. It's very much cemented. These are very impo important information. So that's the next round of discussions. So we discussed this so we don't have to go through. So yes, most of the monitoring station was established there. They are connected to the telemetry. And they send data online. So during the restriction period, we actually got the data. So that's really good. Um, and we deployed moisture sensors so, and then backfill them. So we can aim to see the waterfront as well, which also gives a sort of water storage underneath. Um, so that's what the pumps looks like. So it's a diesel pump with a capacity of one megaliter. So they fill a UQ pool within less than one day. Right. And then they pump water from the river. And then the belt goes for 400 meters. And then they pump upwards. And then they, to avoid erosion, they put the mat underneath. So it's going like a fountain. Yeah. Um, and these are the bore logs. So the top is the clay. Six meters. Six meters of clay. Dry. Dry. So you see this is crumble. And later on, it started to be somehow like a shape, like a Play-Doh. But it's not saturated, because if it's saturated, you know, clay once saturated, it stains on your hands. Well, you know, you play flowers at home, right? So if it's very wet, then it's basically staying on your hands. None of this happens. But later on, the color changes from yellow to silverish. That's a very high saturation, isn't it? 
So, so zero to six meters, very unsaturated. Then a layer that is high saturation. And then after that, we make groundwater. So the groundwater is sandy. When you drill it, you open up. It doesn't fall in shape, because sand never forms a shape. I wouldn't be able to make a shape like that, right? right? The other mo very important thing here is, you know, when we drill from the top, when we drill from the top, it's always unsaturated. That's why we get these. But once we heat these, we heat through this sewage layer, the water actually gush out and then rise by three meters. So I'm just drawing a graph here. So let's say this is where, this is where the water table is, right? So that's where the sewerage color is. And when we drill here, it's always unsaturated. But when you cut it through, the water level goes up here. And then if you measure the water table, it's actually, so this is six meters. And the water table at this location is actually three meters on top of the ceiling of the aquifer. Does this make sense? This completely makes sense. What does it mean? It's an artesian bowl, isn't it? So it's a confined aquifer, right? At least this is what we know. OK, so now I started to form something. Something chemistry come out of my mind. OK, we, we, we produce a pond. Let's say the pond depth is one meter. Any water gets in? To allow this water get in, you need to travel all the way to six meters and then be able to heat. So the head is still higher than underneath. I have an energy on this. I can, I, I, my energy is that this is a tube of a t the tire. So here is the, um, the inside of the tube. The pressure is higher than the atmospheric pressure. If you want to inject gas inside, you need to allow the pump of having a pressure that is higher than this, right? But at least this layer, the skin of the tire, is able to prevent the water moving to this three meter section, okay? So that's exactly what happens. Now, the problem is if you introduce a surface water pond to a clay, is that going to infiltrate or recharge? That's my next question. So I put all the evidences here. I, you know, when I look at this and I was thinking, oh, it's a big yes or no to see whether recharge is going to take place or not at all, right? OK, so I'm basically bring list all the evidences. This is another thing. So when we pump the water in, because of those cracks, they start to follow those crack lines. And then, well, the actually Aboriginal has a name. They call it the water serpent. It's, it's literally like a water serpent meandering on the dry soil. Um, and it looks quite fantastic. Yeah. And later on, it forms a pond. Now, all the evidence is here. We are recharged to water table occur. If so, when? Number one, so that's the evidence. Six meter of clay. Let's let put everybody in the same page, OK? Six meter of clay. I put clay here. And dry. And the last wetting was five years ago. So it's bone dry condition. The second is that sparse vegetation coverage. So you know these are small vegetations. There are trees here. At least this is what happens. Yeah. Aquifer with a confining pressure of three meters higher than the ceiling, yeah? So that's what, so if you, you put a borehole here, this is three meters. Everyone is in, in the same page, yeah? Okay. In environmental water forms a pond with a maximum depth of 1.2 meters. So this, because we pump water inside, then there's a pond, and the depth at the, 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 shallow, the, the deepest point is about 1.2 meters. So in that case, the hydraulic head on the top, at least you know, if you compare here, the, if you use Darcy's law here, the top part has the hydraulic head of 7.2 meters, right? The underneath is three. So you do have a head difference, be able to allow recharge to take place. But to allow this happen, you need to wet up the clay. You need to go through the layer that is able to prevent water moving upward by three meters. 
Okay, the question is, do you think recharge will happen and why? That's the next round of discussions. If every team or every table can give me an answer, yes or no, and then I tell you what happens eventually. I started pondering at the time when things are established. Everyone understand this, yeah? Not a problem. All clear? Okay, so you reckon does it happen or not at all? To the groundwater, yeah. Not re infiltration is definitely taking place. Okay. Yeah, definitely taking place. But then it's a question of whether the water is able to move through the ceiling layer, the grayish layer, as we see there. Okay. Any any uncertainty? I just need to ensure I give you all the information, and you try to give a guess. Yeah. You you you, you believe that all the message is being given here? All clear? You know what the questions are. Bring your answer, please. Yeah. Give a guess. You know, we always face that situation, you know? Yeah? All clear? Yeah. All clear, yeah? Okay. Try to formulate a solution. Guys, you reckon? Yeah. You happen? Is that clear? If there is any information you don't understand, then I can, I can introduce to you. But now it's your estimation. Now you consider yourself as a crystal ball. Is that going to happen or not at all? Okay. I think you guys being stopped discussion. If you have no idea, just God's feeling, really, yeah. <laughs> Ready? Any team? You want to give a start? I'm going to vote for no. You're going to vote no, right? OK, so one no. Yeah, so one no. And any reasons? Well, just from what you've described, Pressure underneath. Yeah. And so, you know, so that even though there's 1.2 meters of head above, you've got more head pushing up. Yeah. Underneath. So yeah. That's why I'm saying no. So, you don't think that um, the uh, recharge is going to take place? Yeah. No. no. Okay. That's good. Thomas? Uh, is that a question? No, no. If it yeah. is semi confined, then it will be able to recharge. Okay, so you believe it's a, rich, it's a yeah. semi confined condition? But it won't be able to, yeah, it'll just be able to get into it, but not out. The water. Okay, you can get in, yeah. but you can't get out. Yeah. Right, okay. So, yes, there is one. Any others? Yes or no? No. No, okay. Yes or no? No. Any reasons? You, you can give some reasons as well. We thought because it's confined, yeah. because the pressure underneath was so much that it wasn't getting up, yeah. that we still wouldn't be able to get down. Okay. That's good. Yeah. It's a very good argument. You said? The too low. Too low. Okay. Three no's. How much team? No. We still have how many? What do you guys reckon? Yes or no? You, you vote no for a reason. What? Uh, because like, it's what you've shown, like, it's kind of confining aquifer you mentioned in your, yeah. uh, when you were telling. So yeah. I don't think so. There is weight for water to get in, given the pressure difference is not sufficient to overcome three meter. Thing. OK, OK. That's a very fire, fair um, yeah, observation. Yeah. You guys? No, right? So five teams voted no, and one team voted yes. 
I thought they exactly the same. Okay, let's, let's look at the monitoring data and that tells something. <clears throat> so there's quite a lot of information here. I, I think we and she also show some of these things before. So we basically established uh, in February and it was running to the end of um, November. That was when the flooding started coming up. So we were basically swimming in the flooding water to save those equipment and we got most of them. And we will re deployment in two weeks time after the next year, next week. Okay, so now what happens? Let's just look at this. A lot of information, too busy. Um, but the, I think the grasp here is, um, if you look at all the pictures, that shows um, the surface water. And um, so this is the surface water level. So now it's getting dried and you see vegetation. And then because it's wet, then it started growing. And then you pump it again, make another pond, and then reduce, and then do another top up, and then reduce. The reduce is because of evapotranspiration and infiltration, two processes, right? And then this is where, the reason why it goes out of chart is because it flood, it was flooded. So we have to retrieve the system. And this is just the, um, we got this, the digital elevation model. We know the surface elevation. We also know the water level at the deepest point. So then you can map out how much area is going to be flooded. So we could also work out the total amount of surface water within that pond. There's no inflow or outflow from the surface water. So we basically construct the embankment to prevent that to happen. So no outflow at all, no leakage. Um, Potential evapotranspiration, so this is a function of weather. So during summer, it's high, up to 15 millimeters per day. During winter, it's only about five, and it goes to 12 again, and back near zero, right? Oh, sorry, five again, right? Cumulative rainfall, so this is basically from the weather station, 400 millimeters. What does 400, what 400 millimeters can do, okay? So think about this, if a porosity is, is 0.5, and if you downpour 400 millimeters in one go, it could only wet up the top one meter of soil. And then this clay is five meters. Recharge locally, sorry, is not going to happen, okay? So this is definitely not something happened. Now, big problems. So this is the groundwater head. Uh, so this is the head AHD. So that's the surface water level. So everything is AHD. Surface water level is always higher than the groundwater levels. But now if you look at the green one, green one is here. It increased by two meters. How long does it take for this to increase? Two weeks. At least this is what happens here. And now if we look at here, SA2, right in the middle of the pond. This increased by one meter. So this is something, again, very different from modeling. So if, if you imagine you apply a recharge, average it to a surface, the, the middle part is where the elevation is going to be highest, and it's going to be bulged like this. But this is completely the other way around, where um, there is, here is a bit small, and this section is slightly high. And then the water level start of decreasing almost in the same manner as the surface water. Does that mean it's a recharge? Okay, so at least the hydraulic head says there is a response from the underneath. So you put, you put some surface water body on top and the groundwater responses to it. We're not sure whether it's a recharge or not. There are many theories. Okay, now let's look at some of the other evidences. Remember, we have EC, and the other more info, important information, temperature. Because the surface temperature is supposed to fluctuate more than groundwater. Remember, we discussed that. Um, so this is the temperature at the surface, the ground level, so it's quite fluctuating. But once it's becoming 4.5 meters below ground level, it becomes more or less like a steady. But if you say the temperature differences, you will see that the one, SA3, has got the biggest temperature fluctuations as compared to the rest of them. So temperature has got a signature that at least um, 
surface water managed to find out its way to groundwater. Okay, so this is at least something from the results. The other thing is electrical conductivity. Remember we discussed that the um, groundwater EC is um, 500 megaliters, uh, sorry, 500 micro siemens, 50,000 micro siemens per centimeter. Fresh water is 200. You see all of the results are fluctuating between the two. It's other indication that at least there are kind of mixture between the two rather than a steady saline water. So these all somehow tells recharge is taking place. But we don't have a direct evidence, right? At least, well, I'm just saying this is other processes. So first the watering, water rise, infiltration, and evapotranspiration, top up, dry, completely dry, and then repeat those processes. So recharge is taking place. Now, what could be the theory behind it? We were pondering, okay, now we find, the, we find recharge is taking place, but do we, do we have any sorts of evidences that is able to tell us this is possibly happening. There are two theories that are completely against each other. At least this is where we are now. Number one, imagine we discussed before that groundwater could be considered as a water-saturated sponge on top of a weight. If you produce a pond, the pond has got the self-weight which squeezes the saturated aquifer and that allows the water level rise. And it also allows the elevated head to be dissipated in all directions as well, right? In that case, you don't need a recharge to allow a response of groundwater level. This is one of the possibility, right? This, is, this means no recharge at all. But it also means there is recharge, why? Um, because if you have this theory, you wouldn't be able to explain why temperature is fluctuating, why EC is fluctuating, even it's very, very small, right? So the reason why this could possibly happen is that there might be some, well, this is hypothetical. We haven't figured out the evidences. Show this graph. The, um, again, six meters, ceiling layers, and then surface got cracks. The clay is characterized by some preferential pathway. This could be cracks, but cracks could go no more, go mo no more than one meter. That was at least we shoveled, we crowbarred it. It doesn't go further down. But there are trees, and tree roots are quite sophisticated, and they may be able to form as the preferential pathway within the clay. And then bulk clay does not conductive at all. It's, it's not conductive. But what could possibly happen is that if you have a single preferential pathway, it goes very quickly through it. And then they can wet it from the top and from the side as well. From the side as well. And then eventually manage to end up with a head on the top being higher than the underneath and there could be a slow recharge process. You don't need a lot of recharge. How much? It's re regarding on the specific, specific storativity. Remember what that number is? 0 0.0001. What does this mean? This means if you have 0 0.1 meter, 0 0.1 meter of recharge, the groundwater level will be raised by one meter. What, that's what that means, okay? So one thing, so if the specific yield, I should write in this way, you don't have to do that. Um, if the specific yield is 0.25, remember? How much water you, can, you need to add in to allow groundwater table to rise by one meter? 0.25, isn't it? So you add 0.25 meters of water, and the groundwater level is able to rise by one meter, isn't it? Same thing, specific storativity, is only 0.001, so you don't need a lot of water. You just need a tiny little bit of water to allow this to happen, right? So this could be a way to explain. But again, it could be a mixing of the two. Hydrostat hydrostatic loading, 
plus a little bit recharge. We haven't find out the trigger yet. So now the next stage is to identify where the preferential pathways are. Right. OK, so final things. It doesn't need a lot of, um, I just give it a very quick. We're finishing around 140 or 150. 150. I'll just quickly introduce what we will do during the tutorial sessions so that you will get, not get bored. And if you have spare time, you can still work on the project. So it's all up to you. Yeah, and you and she will come over. So this is the a mass balance. So water pumped in from the first event, 50 megaliter, and then another top up, 60. Um, so this is 94%, sorry, this is not 4%, 94%. Rainfall is only 4 megaliters which contributes to 6%, which is nothing. And the pond initially rise up to half of it. So total amount of water, half of them stored in the pond, and half of them infiltrated. And then dry it up, and then top up, and then dry. Infiltration is 66%, and evapotranspiration is uh, 34%. Uh, so it's one to two. If we do a second time, you'll find that uh, the ET versus infiltration is one to one. One, two, one. So that's the rough mass balance we worked out. Well, what we didn't measure, actually, we haven't, we haven't measured quite a few things. We haven't tested isotopes, right? Isotope could be another in interesting thing. The other one we haven't put in here, but we did is um, uh, stable uh, chemistry, so irons and chitines. So if they mix all together, you end up with a mixture with two types of um, uh, chemistry signatures. So those are all the other information. So overall, they all tell it happens, but it's a very small amount, at least. Yeah. Um, OK, vegetation responses. This was suggested by one of the um, team. So you see this was, at the very beginning, it's dead dry. But now it becomes like that after watering. And later on, given you've got a more or less like a long-lasting pond, then the aquatic system started to grow. So you end up with um, some they call sneed wheat, sneed wheat. And then this was after the flooding. So that's what happens. Um, OK, so I think now let's finish this, and then we, we, we go to the tutorials. This is another round of discussions. Here is the site. We've got the flat plane, as the Searish one said, fine shows, and also you've got the um, rivers here, which we can identify. We've got the uh, irrigations taking place, and you got those inter salt interception scheme pumps there as well. These sections are within the flood plain, you see, and, and these areas are inundated by artificial watering. And we worked out the effective recharge rate is about one millimeter per day, one millimeter per day. And the region, let's assume it to be this. OK, so the discussion we would like to do, this is what you will see in the actual models, OK? How the stress period and the processes to be considered in the model, it's, it's more or less like what boundary condition you want to construct and what stress period you want to implement in the model. The aim is to identify the amount of salt loads introduced by these individual processes. Is the question clear? Is the question clear for you guys? Question clear? I can repeat if it doesn't. So number one, the stresses you need to apply here. The second is what stress period you would like to apply to, right? You, is that question clear? So this is related to groundwater model, right? Question clear. Question clear, yeah? OK, excellent. So one minute, and then we have eight minute discussion, and then move to the um, tutorial. Sorry, it takes much longer than we thought, because I didn't, introduce, I, I didn't consider more about the discussion sessions. <laughs> but I hope it's enjoyable, yeah? Yeah, sure. So, what we basically mean is kind of artificial.
actually simulating the flood in the, in the flood plane, right? By you, well, within this, you probably have to apply a recharge rate to the model because you wouldn't be able to simulate the infiltration processes. Okay. So that's why I've give um, recharge is one millimeter per day, right? Recharge by the pumping activity that we're doing. Not by pumping, by, the by watering. You got farm irrigations. Yeah, which is on the highland. Yeah, which is on the highland. Yeah. You got your pumping. Yeah. Which is taking the saline water out. SIS, yeah. The yeah. Salt and then receptor. you yeah. also have got the environmental watering, which causes recharge. Like what I'm asking is, when we do environmental monitoring, it's yeah. basically simulating the natural flood cycle, right? Not only by that. So this one is to identify the salt load by individual processes. Because at the end of the day, you need to save your water resources. That's the plan, right? Yeah. yeah. So in that case, um, you need to assess if you add irrigation, yeah. how much extra salt is going to be introduced today. In the groundwater? Or in the, the, in, in, in the, the river. river. In, in the, the river. river, yes. Not to the groundwater. Groundwater, OK. Yeah. The river is where the water yeah, resources yeah. are, yeah? Is the question clear? You formulate a plan, stress period, boundary condition? Yeah? Okay. Try to come up with something. Come up with something. Okay, go ahead if you have a question. So this, again, just a bit of clarification. So this wouldn't, the model wouldn't be tell you the infiltration process at all because recharge is a constant rate, isn't it? So let's assume this is already being figured out. The question here is that are we, how, what stress period we apply to identify the salt loads back to the river? What, whatever, yeah. So let's assuming we the model needs to calculate. The model has to calculate the amount of groundwater discharge to the river. That's what we are trying to assess. Yeah, you, we have to. Yeah. Yes, yes. You, you you could consider each process as a static, like an effective value. You could do that. Always try to simplify before you adding dynamics. I'm just giving a very simple thing. Say, recharge is a constant rate. You apply to it. And what scenario would you like to, to put in? And what boundary condition you would like to put in? That's it. So what, yeah. what are the stresses? Like, what would be a stress that you could apply to a model? Like so I think um, you, you basically look at the history of what happens, right? So farming, pumping, yeah. watering. So it's and like it has what's getting taken out. I guess stress be how much water is being discharged out of the aquifer. Yeah, because you know, in, in the model, remember the, we every single stress period could have could apply different stresses, yeah, yeah. right? So perhaps you can arrange them in a way that is able to single out the effect of individual processes. Does that make sense? Yeah, kind of. Kind of. All clear? Kind of. Let's give a start because we are running out of time. Otherwise, we will be asked to leave. Would you? Would you like to give it a go? Or yeah? No, we're discussing something else. Sorry. Okay. You you don't want to give it a go? Yeah. No. You would like to? Hmm. Yes. Steady state. Yes. Okay. That's a good point. You want to give it a go? <laughs> you don't know? Yeah. Mm, but what boundary condition you would consider? <laughs> Obviously, you will consider river irrigation, pumps, watering. Yeah? Yeah. Constant head? Yeah. All of them no flow? I don't know which way the water is going. Mm. It's going from the top to the, to the, to the underneath. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but if you do that, you wouldn't have groundwater level because all the groundwater is going to be c controlled by your surface water, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. This is actually where the tricks are. <laughs> Any comments about the model implementations? Give it a try. You know, sooner or later you will face that, yeah. 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 Okay. 
Right, okay. Okay, yeah, but don't worry. I think a stress pe that's a matter of you work with the models. Yeah, okay. I think that's a good point. Anything to add up? Sorry? For, for what? Yeah, so, you know, um, you're talking about, um, uh, you know, a stress period just by introducing environmental water on top of the system and see how much extra salt load could be introduced, isn't it? Any others? It will. It will, yeah. Any, any comments from this? Yeah. So uh, let's quickly finish up. We only got three minutes. Anything to add up? Anything to add? Yeah. No? I mean, the boundaries are pretty good. Like it's OK. Do you apply any particular boundaries to the domain? Well, it depends where you kind of want to pull. Like, depends where you want to, like, which part you want to pull. You don't want to make it too big or make it too big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Obviously, it's all connected. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, OK. It's a good point. Yeah, OK. You've already answered that. Any comments? What stress periods? Well, look, try to think beyond, because this is always the situation that I'm facing all the time. Yeah. Yeah. This makes sense to you guys, right? Yeah. Well, that doesn't matter. So you know, it's, um, we're going to practice the model soon. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I think um, in that case, I'll just give you a bit answer of how the model will be introduced, and then we wrap up. So boundary conditions, pumping, agriculture irrigation, and artificial watering. All those processes need to be considered. Period one, boundary plus river. River needs to have a boundary, but the, the domain needs to have a boundary as well. If you don't have a domain boundary, it means that the groundwater level is controlled by the river water level. That's not true. The boundary needs to have a saline groundwater level higher than the river to allow a gaining water condition to form. The second is farming, because farming was introduced about 50 to 70 years ago. So that's the moment you introduce farming. And then because of the farming, it introduced excessive salt, and they introduced salt interception schemes. And then that can apply the effective um, reduction of the um, salt loads to the river. And the finally is the watering, because that was introduced the most lately. So I think the answer overall is to look back on the history of the river and introduce them step by step. And also bear in mind that you could apply those processes as a static process before you add in dynamics. Because the more dynamics you add in, the computational effort would escalate. I'll introduce the rest of things um, during the workshop. Um, I'll upload this to, um, to the Blackboard as well. Um, so I'll see you on there. And um, in the meantime, you can work on the workshop as well. Yeah. Thanks for your time.